very anticlimactic. <laughs> it's just me for the rest of the video. Um, I want to try something different in this video because I've noticed that tutorials are usually either like a full length scene, but long or specific, but very short. Um, and I wanted to see if I could show like a, a full scene, but in a short format. Cause I noticed like, like in a full scene video, like the majority of it is like boring and repetitive stuff that just has to be done, but scattered throughout it, there's like little tricks, little tips, like use this add on or like, here's how I overcame this problem. But you have to watch the full thing to pick it up. And most people don't, <laughs> I've seen the retention. Um, but I wonder what if you could compress it uh, just down to the bare, like just the tips and just show the bits that you can actually learn from. So that's what this video is an experiment on. And you can let me know in the comments what you think. So I was browsing Pinterest one day, um, which I used to think was just for wedding cakes and dresses, uh, but it's actually got some really good inspiration on it and, uh, and reference photos, which are really hard to find. Uh, and I found this image and I thought, it's kind of cool. I think I could give it a shot, give it a go. So loaded it into Blender and uh, then was immediately reminded of the most annoying part of any time you try to recreate a photo reference, uh, getting the perspective in your 3D scene to match the perspective in the photo. Because anyone who's tried this will know that you think things are going well, but then you start adding in objects and building the scene and then you're like, wait a minute, this line doesn't match up with the line in the photo and you start moving the camera around, fiddling with the focal length and it's just a pain. And so you're always in this back and forth trying to get stuff to match and, uh, and I hate it. Um, and then I remembered someone told me about this add-on called Blam, B-L-A-M. Um, and I gave it a try and it's awesome. So I wanted to tell you about it. Basically, you with this add-on, you just draw out using the grease pencil tool um, some perspective lines from the photo, and then you hit calculate, and then it will, based on your perspective lines, it will calculate the exact focal length of the camera in the photo, and then apply that to your Blender camera. Um, so I did that, and it figured out that it was roughly around 30, 30 focal lengths units. <laughs> I'd forgotten what the unit is. Anyways, and, uh, and then when I did that, everything lined up. So then I just added in a plane and you can see, you know, setting it to basic rectangle shape. You can quickly, like it lines up with the subway corridor and that's like the hardest part. So now that that's done, I could just build out the rest of the corridor. You just extrude it, pull it up until the lines match the lines in the photo. Really easy. Um, then for the stairs, I just took one edge loop, which was the width of the corridor, um, duplicated it, made it its own object, and then extruded out to create one singular stair. And then I just used the array modifier to create the rest of the stairs. Save time, whatever you can. Um, and then for the railings, um, I used a cylinder. I just extruded uh, a, a cylinder out. Um, somebody asked me on Twitter if I used curves for it. And I, I like curves, but only for curvy things. If it's mostly straight, I find curves are really annoying to work with. Um, so I, I use a cylinder and then in order to create that curvy, smoothed, uh, rounded edge, um, I used the spin tool. So you go into edit mode, um, then you click the 3D cursor where you want the pivot point to be, and then you just hit spin. And then you choose the, uh, the angle and the number of like the resolution and stuff. Uh, it's really easy and it's it's clean. You know exactly how many vertices are in the mesh um, and it's pretty easy to do. Um, and yeah, just do that for the rest of the subway. It's not hard, it just takes a bit of time. Uh, after that, you wanna see how it's gonna look with lighting. So I generally just drop in some placeholder bulbs, like some cylinders with an emission thing on it. Just see that it looks generally, you know, similar to the reference photo. Um, and very important to make sure that you're using filmic color space. If you haven't seen my video on why that's important, you can see that uh, in the description. But seriously, it's just, it's vital for a scene like this because otherwise you'd have bulbs blowing out and it would look horrible. Um, after that, it's time to do some materials. So I started with the tiled wall. 
Um, and originally I went online and tried to find a tile texture, but I didn't really like any that I found. So I actually used Substance Designer, um, which I'm not advertising or anything like that, but it is a kick-ass program. For those who don't know what it is, it's a procedural texture generating program. Um, and it's really big in the industry right now. Um, most game companies, animation houses, whatever, they're all using substance because it allows you to create essentially any material that you want. So you never come across a material and go like, oh, I can't find the exact texture for that. If you know substance, it'll allow you to, you know, expand and do a lot more. So I'm not a pro at it, but I was able to knock together something um, which created a nice tiled wall. Very simple, there's like easy sliders, choose the height and width of the tiles. Like it's pretty much a tile generator out of the box. Like it's got this nice easy node, um, so it's really easy. Um, and the other material I created with Substance was the ceiling stucco. Um, again, I, I started with an image text that I found online, but for something like stucco, stucco is like purely bump. And so if you use an image text, you're only gonna be sort of guessing the bump or, or trying to extract bump off it, but it's gonna be a little bit glitchy and it's not gonna look as good as if something was created purely digitally using something like Substance. Um, so anyway, so I used Substance for it. Um, and that's that. Then for the floor, um, I just used a tile material off of Polygon. It wasn't an exact fit, but you know, it's mostly level to the camera, so you don't really see it much anyway. And I did a bit of tweaking and it, it looked okay. Then for the tactile floor, which is uh, like those little bumps, yellow bumps for blind people that are sort of annoying to <laughs> step on. Um, that one was really easy because that's just a, a material that we already created on Polygon. So I just downloaded that put it in there and it looked great. Um, then for, I noticed in the reference photo, there's like these rubber strips that go down the corridors, like both the, the bottom and the top. And there's really two ways that you could go about making something like that. Like one, you could, you know, add a loop cut into the wall and then like separate the material, like make this material black and then this one tile, whatever. But um, I figured that actually, it, it's actually a, like in, in the real world, it's actually like jutting out of the wall. So it's a physically, a separate object than the wall. So it's better if it's a separate object. So what I did was really easy. I just selected the edge that goes all up down the corridor. I duplicated it, made it its own object, and then I just extruded it up a little bit to the height of the rubber. And then I used a solidify modifier to uh, push it out a little bit. And then that was the rubber strip. Um, so I did that for both the floor, the ceiling, as well as the uh, along the steps, that little, uh, there's a little like rubber thing along there as well. And then for the rest of it, there's just a bunch of other little things that need to be modeled for the scene. So there's like this divider in the reference photo, and that's just like, it's a cube. You just extrude it out, pull it down. Uh, the fluorescent bulbs, like giving detail to them. Um, and then the pipes, that one probably took the longest, but it's not hard, it's just like cylinders and then you add cubes to make the bolts and the brackets and things. Like this stuff just takes time. So you just put on a nice podcast, listen to some music and, uh, and just get through it. Um, I did actually find a really cool program I wanna to recommend to you and that is Pure Ref. So Pure Ref is a program basically designed for artists that have a lot of reference photos open. So essentially you load this up on a spare monitor and then as you're working and you find a photo online, you can just paste it onto this infinite canvas. And then as you're working, like instead of having to like dig through a folder and try and find a specific reference photo and look at that, like you can just zoom in and out of the canvas, pan around. Um, and it's, it's really handy. Um, I'm surprised I didn't know about it before. It's a, it's a really cool program. So definitely do that. Like previously I used to like mock it up in Photoshop myself and it just took forever. So having something like that is a, is a big help. So the render was looking nice, but um, whenever I posted it on Twitter, everyone said that it looked too clean, um, which I agreed with. So, uh, so I went on Polygon and I used some surface imperfections, which are maps that are basically designed to add wear and tear to materials. So for example, I got a footprint map and then I added that to the floor. Um, I got a grunge, like leaky sort of thing. And then I added that to the wall and then I added uh, fingerprints to the railings. 
And basically with all of those maps, you just drop that into the roughness input of your shader and then it affects like the, the reflection. So it's, it's subtle and it's something that's not like in your face, like dirt everywhere, but it's like when the light hits it, you can see like it like reflecting off it. So it looks, um, it looks quite nice. And although it wasn't in the reference photo, uh, I really wanted to add some grunge and dirt to the divider. Um, because when I looked at the divider in the render, it looked too squeaky clean. Even though you compare it to the reference photo, the reference photo looks squeaky clean as well, but somehow it just looked weird in the render. Sometimes that happens. So, uh, so I wanted to add some, uh, some grunge to it, right? Um, but I didn't want it to be like a uniform, like tiled grunge over the whole thing. I wanted it to look real. So to do that, you got to do some texture painting. Um, but I've never really found like texture painting to be that good in Blender. Um, but I decided to give it another go and I finally figured it out. I realized that the reason that texture painting usually usually doesn't go so well, at least when I've tried it, is because the default brush in Blender, like it's really, you're supposed to change those settings. <laughs> you're supposed to add textures. You're supposed to fiddle around. You're supposed to make it look like the brush that you want it to be. So I, I finally figured out how to do it. So this is what I did. So I created a new brush um, and then I added a new texture to it. So I got this droplet residue texture off Polygon. Um, and then when you add that in, you wanna check the box that says calculate. And to be honest, I don't know what it does, but I believe it guesses the alpha based on the values in the image. I'm guessing there, but anyways, it's important you check that box. Uh, then you set the blend type to multiply use black paint, and then when you draw over it, you'll see the texture appear. Um, but if you draw, you'll see that it's like repeating the texture, uh, which isn't good. But if you set the brush mapping and you check that little random box, um, th then it will rotate it every single time that you paint it and it starts to look like a real brush, which is really cool. Um, I also created another brush for uh, like a grunge leak thing. Um, and I did the same thing. The only thing I changed though was the brush mapping. I changed that to anchored, which is instead of clicking and dragging it, like spraying it out, um, you just click and drag out one single stamp. Um, so you just, yeah, you just add a couple of those. And if you're using a tablet, you can get some really nice results really quickly. Um, and that was it. So then I just used that for the color and the roughness of that divider and then had a cool looking asset. So turns out you can do some nice painting in Blender. Didn't know you could, but there you go. So the scene was looking good, but I wanted to make it look eerie for the animation. Give it like a creepy, like off-putting, uh, real <laughs> typical subway vibe. So I wanted to put a flickering light in the background. So um, the easiest way to make something flicker, like it's pretty simple to do in Blender, right? You find the object, which is casting the light, which in this case was the bulb. You find the emission value of that in the materials. You mouse over it and you hit I, and that creates a keyframe. Then if you go to the F curve modifier, you can move it and add more keyframes around whatever and make it so that the values go like this. And then you get something that looks like it flickers. However, the problem with that is that I am lazy. <laughs> and I don't wanna hand animate anything. Uh, I want the computer to do it for me. So. Here's a little trick. If you select that one keyframe, then you hit N on the keyboard. This is in the F curve modifier. You'll find there's a modifier stack. That's right, there's a modifier stack for the animation properties in Blender. So there I found a modifier called noise. Um, and what this does is that it creates noise for your keyframes. So the, the line sort of starts to look like this. Well, if you increase the scale, suddenly it's going, like this, um, and that looks okay, but it's sort of like a jittery fade effect, I noticed, and when I looked at reference video of fluorescent bulbs flickering, uh, they're generally like on or off, right? It's sort of more like a binary thing. So after the noise modifier, I added in a limit function so that it limits the amount that it can be, like the maximum value, and then limits the, the minimum value. Um, and then basically I just set those to like, you know, whatever the on value is like 40 and then the bottom value, um, I actually found like, like a level of like five. So it's not totally off because like fluorescent bulbs always have a little bit of light in them. Um, and then I just crank the scale way up. So then that line looks more like a binary sort of thing. 
and that creates a flickering look. Uh, you know, it's not perfect, but uh, but it works. So the biggest difference between the render and the reference image right now is of course that the reference image has this cool bluish aqua tinge to it. Uh, so color grading. The way you do that in Blender is you go to the compositor and you add one node, which is the color balance node, because that's really all you need to do color grading in Blender. Um, so, you know, you've never used it before. Left hand wheel that handles the dark tones, the middle wheel that handles the mid tones and the right hand wheel handles the highlights. And generally I usually only fiddle with the middle and the right hand wheel. Um, but here's the interesting thing, which I just learned this recently, is that um, the correction formula, like the default is lift gamma gain. Um, and that worked fine, I guess, when you were using the default color space for Blender. But as I mentioned in the Filmic video, you're using the Filmic color space, which you should always be using. If you're not, make sure you watch that video because it's, you know, it'll change your life. Um, when you're using the Filmic uh, color space, you should be using offset power slope. Um, now, I was informed of this by Troy Sabotka, who's the guy who helped me make that filmic video and even made the filmic color space. And he gave me a whole explanation for a mathematical equation to explain why lift gamma gain like chews up color data and like will result in ugly looking uh, grading, whereas offset power and slope is much cleaner and it works better. I didn't understand all the math stuff, but I just used the, uh, the new offset power slope and that's it. So there's nothing really that will change except for, for whatever reason, I'm sure there's a reason for it, but I don't know it. The middle wheel will actually be the opposite. So if you set it to blue, then actually it will turn out yellow. So just set it to the opposite of wherever it is that you want. Um, and that's that. And then I just added in a glare node to give a little tiny little hint of a glow to the fluorescent bulbs. And then that was that. And there you go. We finally had a match between the render and the reference photo, which was the whole point in all of this, which was good. Um, but I wanted to do an animation to prove that it's a 3D scene, right? Um, only problem was that one single render took 30 minutes on my uh, 1080 Ti, which is a pretty expensive graphics card. Uh, 30 minutes. So I wanted to do 250 frames. So do the math, it was gonna be about 125 hours. Um, I didn't wanna spend that long on it. And I tried a bunch of things. Um, I ended up using 3000 samples to get it you know, pretty clear. And then I used the denoiser, just checked the box. I didn't change any settings, just left it default. Um, but it was still, it was 30 minutes, right? Um, and then a guy on Twitter, Derek Barker, shout out, thanks for your help. Um, he showed me that there is this feature which I didn't know existed. And this is it. If you go into the scene panel, there's a box at the bottom called Simplify, which you might not have ever used before. I thought it's just for like dropping the uh, master level of subdivisions down and you can do that. You can do a bunch of different things there, but there's uh, a value right at the bottom that says AO bounces render. Um, so I set that to two and it cut the render time, not in half, but down to one third of what it was originally. Went from 30 minutes down to 10 minutes. And if you have a look at the difference between these two renders, you might think there's not much difference other than one of them looks darker. And in fact, I did a, a difference value in Photoshop and you can see that that's really the case. One of them just looks darker. And I was really confused about what is actually going on. Like I was thrilled, I'm happy that, it, that this was happening, but I didn't know what that value actually was doing. Turns out most people don't either because I was asking on Twitter, not really anyone knew. There's no documentation for it. I finally posted a question on Blender Stack Exchange and someone told me that essentially, and I still don't really understand this, but what that does is that it tells it that after a certain number of uh, light bounces, I believe it treats the material that's receiving the light bounces. Um, it only, the, the light only hits the diffuse shader and ignores, I think, the reflections something like, it basically simplifies a shader beyond a certain number of light bounces. Again, this is like, this is new to me. I don't understand it myself and I'm trying to figure it out, but that's that's what I think. Um, anyway, I set it to two, it still looked great and it cut it down to 10 minutes. So it's a really cool, if I was to do my uh, like 16 tips or whatever for improving your render times, which if you haven't seen, you can watch that video. 
I would definitely include this in there because I didn't know it existed. And it's uh, it's an awesome one. Um, and there you go, guys. The finished animation. And that was the full process. So what do you think of this video format, this shortened uh, style? I personally like it um, because I think it cuts out a lot of the monotonous, boring, repetitive tasks um, and makes it so that people actually watch to the end, I would hope. But let me know what you think in the comments. I'm always open. Um, also in the description, you can find links to all the textures. Anything that I've referenced in this video, you can uh, find it there. Subscribe if you want to see more and give it a like if you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. Bye.